have a presentation on vernal pools uh, with Steve Faccio from the Vermont Center for Eco Studies. Uh, I met Steve about 25 years ago when he was working for VINS, and I had just uh, taken a teaching position at Braintree, which was half time at that point. I was looking for something else to do, and we got an indoor job at Finns, uh, which was perfect for me. Um, I could work through a lot of the work at home, come in three mornings a week. Uh, and the best thing about that job at Finns, I could come in very early in the morning and work with Steve and uh, Chris Rimmer and Kent McFarlane, which uh, are conservation biologists there, uh, taking birds out of the nest and banding them. And uh, Steve and, and his friend were very kind to let sort of a, a newbie like me help out in that uh, position. But Steve and Chris and Kent left uh, in the late, late 90s. Uh, no, some. It was I think early it was, part of yeah, it. Yeah, I think it was eleven or eleven years ago. Yeah. To found the Vermont uh, Center for Eco Studies. Uh, Steve is still very interested in, in birds, as they all are there, but he is the lead person for vernal pools, and he's going to talk with us tonight, share some of his expertise. Thank you, Steve. Sure. Thanks, Tom. Um, happy to be here tonight. Um, after three beautiful days, we're kind of back to the reality of April. A little cooler weather, but still isn't too bad out there. Um, maybe some of you have uh, seen some amphibian migration the last uh, last weekend. There was a lot happening last weekend, a lot, a lot of movement going on. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about some of that stuff tonight. Before I start, I just want to mention I have some handouts up here. You're welcome to help yourself to. Um, there's three related to vernal pools. It's kind of a, just kind of an overview of what vernal pools are. Um, there's one about um, uh, some research I did uh, a while back doing some radio telemetry with salamanders to see how far salamanders move away from vernal pools in the summer so we know how much habitat they need around uh, around these coral pools. So that sort of summarizes that research. And then there's uh, another one uh, talking about forest management guidelines around vernal pools. We're kind of related to follow up to that research. Kind of the reason why we did that research was to find out how much habitat they need and then, and then talk about how we can better manage the forest in those areas. So that's some suggested guidelines for that. This is our uh, oh, the Vermont Center for Eco Studies. This is our current newsletter, which is last fall's newsletter. Our spring newsletter isn't out yet. We do a newsletter twice a year. Um, and then this report is something that I, I published a couple years ago, the status of Vermont forest birds. Um, this is a, a summary of 25 years of bird monitoring in Vermont uh, in, in forest habitats. Um, so uh, if you're interested in any of that, feel free to pick one of those up. Um, all right. I would encourage you to ask questions as we go along. Try to keep it uh, informal as we go. I have um, some videos to show as we go. I don't know if we can turn out the lights. Maybe it might be a little bit better. Keep trying. One of those will work. There we go. Um, usually I bring a couple books with me that I like to um, show to the group as additional reference materials, but my, my intern has absconded with my vernal pool books and I can't seem to get them back. So a couple of slides of my two favorite vernal pool books, the one on the left, Vernal Pools. Natural History and Conservation by Elizabeth Colburn um, is a great sort of armchair naturalist kind of natural history and look at vernal pools really in depth um, about what they are, their values, and, and a lot about the animals that utilize them. She's particularly strong with invertebrates, so the, so the chapter on invertebrates is really good. Um, 
the book on the right, Science and Conservation of Vernal Pools, uh, by our, the editors are Aram Calhoun and Philip de Maynardier, both from Maine. Um, this, that's, this is a little bit more of a scientific approach to um, the natural history and science of vernal pools. Uh, a very good book, it's pretty expensive. Like, you know, we're talking like $120. It's kind of a textbook. Uh, Elizabeth Colburn's book is more like $30 or $40. Um, both really good references. And then finally, my favorite field guide is this little field guide to the animals of vernal pools. Really great resource, colored photographs and illustrations throughout. It's waterproof, so you can take it out in the field on rainy days. Um, and it's only $12 from the Massachusetts Fish and Wildlife Department. Don't buy it on Amazon because it's like 40 bucks on Amazon. Uh, but $12 from Massachusetts Fish and Wildlife. Um, so a great, that's a great little resource. <clears throat> All right, so as we uh, gaze into the reflection of a, of a vernal pool, I like to start off, if I can find my, here it is over here. I'd like to start off with a poem by Robert Frost. Some of you may know it's called Spring Pools. And I might, well, we'll see if I can get through. I might need a light, yeah. Thanks. <clears throat> These pools that, though in forests, still reflect the sky almost without defect. And like the flowers beside them, chill and shiver, will, like the flowers beside them, soon be gone. And yet, not out by any brook or river, but up by roots to bring dark foliage on. The trees that have it in their pent up buds to darken nature and become summer woods, let them think twice before they use their powers to blot out and drink up and sweep away these flowery waters and these watery flowers from snow that melted only yesterday. All right, we can hit the lights back and sorry to spoil the mood with turning the lights back on. All right, just a brief outline. Uh, I'm gonna talk about what vernal pools are, kind of their values and their functions in the ecosystem. Focus a lot on the natural history and ecology of some of the animals that utilize vernal pools, mostly the amphibians, but but um, we'll also touch on some of the invertebrates. And then I'll finish up with just touching on a couple of the projects that I'm working on that also involve uh, volunteers, in case you're interested in, in getting involved. So what are, what are vernal pools? Well, there are these small temporary wetlands that um, usually occur in forested situations. Um, they're shallow, usually only a foot or two, maybe, maybe occasionally deeper than that. Um, isolated from other types of wetlands, other permanent wetlands. They usually have these fairly well-defined boundaries. Um, they're not they're sort of like big swamps that can sort of go on forever or, or be hard to define. They're usually fairly easily defined and, and they're small. So most vernal pools in Vermont are less than a tenth of an acre in size. Um, of, of about um, almost a thousand pools that we visited in Vermont, uh, about 70% are less than a tenth of an acre. Uh, and then about, about another 20% are less than a quarter of an acre. So they can be larger. There are some that are an acre in size, but most of them are quite small, shallow, isolated from permanent wetlands. They're fed primarily by surface water. So runoff, spring rains, snow melt, uh, and there usually is not a connection to the ground, groundwater supply. You'll notice I'm saying a lot of usuallys. There's, there's very often in nature there aren't these hard and fast rules. There's a lot of gray areas where sometimes we can't really say, is that a vernal pool? Well, it's, it's more of a seep, but it's functioning like a vernal pool because it's, it's deep enough and it holds water long enough. So there's some gray areas. They have this distinct seasonal hydrology. That's one of the important things about them, is that they dry out, if not every year, then in most years, or only in, maybe only in drought years. But that helps to prohibit fish populations from becoming established. 
Um, and that's really key for the animals that use vernal pools because these are um, animals that haven't evolved with fish predators. So the amphibians that use vernal pools uh, don't have any defenses against fish, unlike amphibians that live in ponds, like green frogs and bullfrogs and newts. Their eggs, their tadpoles are all toxic. Fish learn very quickly not to eat them. But the amphibians that use vernal pools don't have those defenses, so they would be quickly consumed by predatory fish if they were to be established in a, in a vernal pool. So seasonal hydrology, they're usually fill, full to the brim this time of year, and then as the season progresses, that water level declines due to, you know, as the spring rains sort of diminish, temperatures increase over the summer, there's more evapotranspiration with the trees and just evaporation, and the, the vernal pools slowly will dry. Usually by August, most vernal pools are dry. August or September, unless it's a really wet year, um, they may uh, they may retain some water or they may retain water. There are some semi-permanent pools that function as vernal pools, meaning they they only dry out in drought years, but remains moist or wet many other years. In order for there to be successful breeding with amphibians, they really need to hold water for at least three months. And the longer uh, of the hydro period of a vernal pool, the longer the period that it holds water, usually leads to a greater increase in the species diversity. So you can have these short hydro period pools. They might be pools that only hold water for a month or two. They're probably not gonna support successful breeding for amphibians, but there might be a few dozen species of invertebrates that can live there. But then you get vernal pools that last three months or four months, and you're gonna have a lot more invertebrate community, a lot higher diversity, and you're also gonna have a lot higher diversity of amphibians that will use those pools. And what we don't know <clears throat> is how climate change is going to affect uh, vernal pools. Um, we know that the predictions for climate change are for uh, more, uh, greater intensity of storms, uh, that could be a good thing. It could mean that vernal pools will, will the hydro periods of vernal pools won't change too much because those intense storms will tend to reflood them, keep them flooded. But if we do have warmer summers, uh, that could mean uh, that we could have, it could shorten the hydro period and that could have a big effect on, uh, on the uh, success of vernal pools. <clears throat> And the last characteristic is that they provide uh, habitat, critical habitat for a variety of invertebrates and amphibians. For the amphibians, it's just breeding habitat. These amphibians don't need this, these vernal pools as adults. They only migrate there to lay their eggs and then they return to the forest. The eggs and the tadpoles need the vernal pools to develop but the adults are just using them as a nursery, just as a place for those eggs and tadpoles to develop. The invertebrates are a mixed bag. Some of them spend their entire lives in vernal pools. Others just go through a developmental phase and, and as adults they can, they can leave. And others like this diving, the, the predaceous diving beetle on the left, um, they have the capability of flying as an adult. So they might land in a vernal pool and spend a few weeks or months there, and then they can fly to another water body as the, as the pool shrinks up. So there are literally dozens, if not hundreds, of species of invertebrates that you can find in vernal pools. That's where the real diversity is, a fewer number of amphibians that you'll find. <clears throat> and it's one of the only ecosystems, it's the only one I can think of, that's defined by its animal community rather than its plant community. So usually you think of a natural community like a red maple swamp or a beech maple forest or a spruce fir forest or a um, sedge meadow, um, something like that. It's always defined by their, the plants that are found there. Vernal pools don't have any characteristic plants. In fact, they're pretty devoid of plants for the most part. And so they're really defined more by their animal communities, pretty unique in that, in that way. And I'd say in the last probably 10 years, 
uh, ecologists have really come to the, the realization that vernal pools are a keystone ecosystem. And by that, I mean they have a much, they have a very big influence on the surrounding forest community than you would expect based on the size. I mean, you might have a vernal pool the size of this room. It's not a very big, not a very big water body, but it can have a big influence on the surrounding community. So we call that a keystone ecosystem. There are also keystone species that have a big influence on the surrounding community, like probably the most uh, common or the most uh, talked about is the beaver. Beavers have a huge influence on the surrounding ecosystems because of their ability to build dams, create wetlands, and, uh, and, then, and then move on. And while there's not a lot of data on what that influence is, how that, how, you know, it's hard, kind of fast information about what, what that influence is, it's primarily in the, in the impact it has in the food chain or the food web of the surrounding forest. So this guy, probably the best data is from Brian Windmiller, who is a PhD student at Tufts University back in the 90s. And as part of his PhD, he estimated the, the biomass, the weight of all the small, of all the breeding birds, all the small mammals, and all the amphibians in a 50 acre forest surrounding a single vernal pool in suburban, just outside of Austin, in suburban Concord, Massachusetts. And um, so his estimates, here's what he came up with. He came up with 13 pounds of breeding birds in this 50 acre forest, 108 pounds of small mammals, which if I recall correctly, were squirrel size and smaller. And of the seven species of amphibians that bred in this vernal pool, he came up with 271 pounds of amphibians. So that's a pretty big influence on the surrounding forest. You know, more, more biomass than mammals and birds put together, at least small mammals. Um, and I kind of think of vernal pools as like fast food joints in the forest. A lot of animals take advantage of them if they don't, you know, either during the breeding season when the adults are there, there are a number of species that really key in on that activity um, to get their food. And then later in the summer, after the breeding's over, and all those little uh, metamorphs, all those little amphibians, frogs and salamanders are leaving the pool, uh, they're just little protein snacks hopping out of the water that are available for a lot of other uh, animals to take advantage of. So a huge amount of energy being transferred from an aquatic system to the terrestrial forest. So here's a good example. Garter snakes are one of the bigger predators of amphibians. Um, they really key in on them, but, and as well as a lot of mammals. Raccoons often will take advantage of vernal pools. This is a, a game camera from Weybridge, Vermont, set up on a vernal pool that these volunteers are monitoring, and that pole in the middle is, is a PVC pipe that we give them to put in the vernal pool to m measure the water height, and then attached to the, to the bottom of that PVC pipe is a little temperature logger. So it measures the water temperature every hour throughout the whole summer. And the main reason for that is so that when the pool dries, we'll know exactly when that happens because the temperatures will start changing dramatically. Instead of being consistent with the water temperature, it'll start re reading the air temperature. So we'll have a tr an exact record of when that pool dried. So we're doing this with pools all over the state. But anyway, he's got a game camera set up, and here he's got a whole, a whole group of raccoons feeding on the edge of the pool. That's one, that's, that was on April 9th, just a couple weeks ago. And then the next night, he's got a couple of barred owls, one barred owl sitting on the pole, the other barred owl up in the upper left in flight, so it's kind of blurry. April 10th, and then here's April 14th, same two barred owls. Barred owls are probably the most common predator I see at vernal pools. I don't, I don't think it's any coincidence that barred owl chicks hatch this time of year. They take advantage, full advantage of the, the bounty that they can get uh, at vernal pools, especially when the wood frogs are chorusing and breeding. But we have a little video here we're going to go to. 
Um, this is a game camera uh, set up elsewhere. I'm just gonna pause it for a moment. This is a game camera set up in Keene, New Hampshire, and I'm not gonna watch the whole video, but we're gonna scroll through it a little bit, of a barred owl coming to a vernal pool. Night after night, this is May 2nd. I'm gonna scroll ahead to another night here. Day and night, actually, he's, this barred owl is hunting. Here, here it is, wa wading around in the leaf litter, picking up, uh, picking up things. And there's one point in here where he picks up a salamander. Flew away with something there. I think it's, I think it's right about here. Yes, he's going to pick up a salamander in his beak. Right. It's coming up. He's got it in his foot there. There it is. Got it in his beak right there. <clears throat> So waiting, waiting around, actually, you know, finding spotted salamanders with its feet, pretty remarkable stuff. So uh, yeah, if I go to a vernal, vernal pools at night, I'm, you're guaranteed to see barred owls there because really common. Um, so a lot of the wildlife that vernal pools support are really dependent on forested habitat. And so vernal pools are really, um, really important in these in these forested systems. Of course, you can find vernal pools in fields. Um, what's a field but a, around here, but a cleared forest. Um, and if you let it go long enough, it'll grow back to forest. Um, but they're really dependent on forested habitat for a number of reasons. Uh, one of them is that the base of the food chain in a vernal pool is the leaf litter that falls into the pool. It's a detritus-based food web. So that leaf litter, in this case, primarily from beech leaves that have fallen into the forest, into the pool, is the base of the food chain. And species like caddisfly larvae and isopods up in the upper right, two very abundant invertebrates in vernal pools, they're shredders. They shred leaf litter up into smaller pieces to eat it. And as they're doing that, it, uh, it, it speeds up the decomposition of the leaf litter in the vernal pools, as well as speeds up uh, the growth of what's called paraphyton, which is a, it's sort of a fuzz that grows on leaf litter and on sticks in vernal pools. It looks like a fuzz. It's a complex, nutrient-rich um, uh, fuzz, that's a technical term, uh, <laughs> that's made up of fun, uh, fun, fungi and bacteria and algae and something else I'm forgetting is in there too. And it's really important for the wood frog tadpoles. That's primarily what they feed on, especially uh, when they're fairly young. They feed on that paraphyton. Um, they'll also feed on some algae. And as they get older, they'll also feed on some animal matter as well. Um, so forest, forest, the connection to the forest is, is, uh, is important for vernal pools. Um, some of the other invertebrates uh, include the, uh, this really unique species, the, the fairy shrimp. We don't know, this is the knob-lipped fairy shrimp, which is the one I see. Um, it's the only one I've seen in Vermont. Some people have said they've seen this another species in more in southern Vermont. <clears throat> uh, really unique organism. They're found you know, all over the globe. They are a, a shrimp, they're a crustacean. They're about an inch long, maybe three quarters when they're full grown, three quarters of an inch or so. Um, they're probably hatching about this time of year, maybe a little bit later. Then they very small when they hatch. They go through a number of instars, a number of growth spurts, growth phases, before they reach the adult size, probably by mid-May or early May. Uh, when they'll mate, they'll lay eggs, and then the adults will die. The eggs sink to the bottom of the pool and um, wait for that to happen again. There's not a whole lot we know other than that kind of those basics. There have been some research to suggest that their eggs um, have to go through a period of drying and freezing before they'll become viable. We don't know if that's true for all species or just some. Um, so, the, but, we, but what I do know is that some years you go to a vernal pool and there'll be millions of fairy shrimp. You can't miss them, they're everywhere. Other years you can go to the same vernal pool at the same time of year uh, and there's no fairy shrimp. So they're very enigmatic, uh, really beautiful to watch when they, when they swim. 
very graceful. Uh, and this knob-lipped species is this always this orange kind of color, salmon kind of color. As I said, they can be really dense at times, really abundant. Uh, and we're going to go to another video just so you can see them. Watch how they swim because they're. Uh, they can be easy to mistake for other species of invertebrates. It's good to have a search image to know what you're looking for for fairy shrimp. They look like they're swimming upside down. Very graceful with those eight rows of feathery legs. Um, really beautiful to watch. Very smooth swimmers. That's a female with the egg sac at the base of the tail. All right, that's that. <clears throat> All right, let's talk a little about the amphibians, which is kind of my more of my area of expertise than the than the invertebrates. Uh, although I am very interested in in fairy shrimp and learning more about their ecology. So these are the four species that are really vernal pool dependent. So from the starting on the left, the spotted salamander, which is kind of the poster child of the vernal pool movement. Uh, in the middle is the blue spotted salamander, a little bit more rare and uh, less widely distributed. On the far right is the Jefferson salamander, and then the bottom, the wood frog. These are the four that are really dependent. There are other species that will use vernal pools, spring peepers will, um, great tree frogs will, but they're not really dependent on them so much. Um, they're actually, I would say they're more common in, in other types of wetlands, those two. And all of these can also use other types of wetlands. They're not limited to just vernal pools, but um, there's a couple, you know, they're, they're without vernal pools, these guys are going to be much less common because they can't breed in all kinds of wetlands for that reason we talked about earlier. They don't have defenses against predators or against fish, really. Um, but they can breed in you know, shallow uh, edges of, of marshes where there's a lot of cover, a lot of vegetation and cover, and fish really can't get into those shallower margins. They can breed in some, in some beaver ponds um, that don't have predatory fish populations. Um, uh, and other, other types of wetlands. But these guys are really the key vernal pool indicators. So let's talk a little bit about these two salamanders, the Jefferson and the Spotted, which tend to share uh, habitats pretty closely. <clears throat> oh, we got another video. Um, so in the early spring, this time of year, salamanders are, are migrating to the breeding pools. And uh, when they, when they arrive, usually they're, they're migrating on rainy nights, only on rainy nights, um, because amphibians are sensitive to dehydration. Um, uh, so they avoid, they avoid moving in the daytime mostly. Wood frogs will, but salamanders rarely will. When, the, when they arrive, the males gather up in these congresses, these groups of males, and, and they're called congresses. And they're basically just hanging out. It's like a middle school dance. With the boys hanging out together, hoping that the girls come over and ask them to dance. And that is literally what happens. Okay, if, when a female approaches the group, um, she will basically select her partner, and they move away from the group. Uh, this is just one getting some air. The, the, the two will move away from the group and go through a courtship ritual, which we're not going to see in this video. But um, it is a great video of, of a Congress. So the courtship ritual, it's the male and the female sort of dancing on this underwater dance. And then what you might notice uh, scattered around on the bottom are these little white spots. Those are spermatophores, little sperm packets that the males deposit. <clears throat> so as the, the male and the female move away from the group, the male will deposit his spermatophores, and the female will pick those up. And these are spermatophores. So it's a little jello, jelly capsule that's sort of capped off with a little packet of sperm on the top. And he might drop four or five of these. The female will pick uh, some of them up. I don't know how many she picks up, if she picks up just one or two. 
but she picks them up with her cloaca, which is her, her vent, um, where, where waste is excreted. Uh, she picks up those sperm packets, and the, her eggs are fertilized internally. And then a few hours later, she'll deposit, deposit eggs. So, Steve, I yeah. have a question. So you show the Congress with just all the males and the spermatophores there. If the female comes and picks a male, how does she know which spermatophore goes to right. the male? Well, when, when she moves away, the male and the female move away from the Congress and they go through their dance. He'll actually drop his spermatophores during the dance and she'll pick them up. Oh, so that's just a waste that so, the guys are yeah, all hanging out. Yeah, exactly <laughs> correct. And the, what, what we believe it is, is the young males who know they don't have a chance at a dance, <laughs> just hoping. <laughs> so these are, these are what the spermatophores might look like if you arrive you know, the day after the dance. Um, so it's evidence, because you, chances are very slim if you go to a vernal pool during the day, you're gonna see salamanders. They're probably there, they're under the leaf litter, but they stay very well hidden. It's really rare to see them during the day, but you can see the evidence that they were there. Um, so at least you know. How long do they usually stay in the vernal pools after they migrate there? For the salamanders, it, it, it varies by sex. So the males will stay a week or two weeks, perhaps. The females will leave shortly after they lay their eggs. Um, they ideally will wait for a rainy night, uh, but they will move just out of the pool and stay right near the edge of the pool um, underground and wait for a rainy night to be able to move further away from the pool. Yeah. So the female might only be there for a day or two, um, and then she wants to get out of there. You know, she doesn't have any other, she wants to eat, you know, right? She's been spending the winter underground. They immediately migrate to these ice cold waters to breed. And then, you know, then it's time to get some nutrition. Um, the males will hang out longer. So they're, um, the, the female will lay from one to three egg masses, really depending on her her, probably her age and her fitness. And each egg mass can contain anywhere from around, about 30 to about 250 eggs. So one female could have as many as 750 or so eggs or embryos um, in these uh, egg masses. When, they, when they're laid, they're about the size of a golf ball or a little bit smaller, but they pretty quickly swell up to be about the size of a baseball. And they're not always round, they can be sort of oblong shaped, but they're pretty big and impressive. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about identifying egg masses later on. The Jefferson salamander, however, um, <clears throat> lays these small, much smaller egg masses, and she might lay from one to three as well, each female, but each egg mass only contains between five and maybe 30 embryos, so a much smaller, much less conspicuous egg mass, which much lower numbers of embryos. And the Jeffersons go through the same kind of ritual that the Spotteds do. They have congresses and the female picks the, the partner she's interested in. And then the rest of the year, the adults are spent, you know, after they breed and eventually all leave the pool, after a week or two, the adults disperse out into the surrounding forest. And this was the question that, <clears throat> that um, part of my research sort of addressed, uh, looking at how far do they move after breeding out into the forest. So I radio, tra radio tagged spotted salamanders and Jefferson salamanders down at Marsh Billings Rockefeller Forest in uh, uh, Park and Woodstock and tracked them through the summer for six months from May to October. And uh, basically, they move about 200 yards, up to 200 yards away from the breeding pools. And other studies have pretty much confirmed this with, with these species as well in other parts of their range. Um, that they, they don't go real far, but it's further than a lot of people would have thought, 200 yards away from the pool. Uh, females tend to go further than the males. Uh, we don't know why. And, uh, and during the rest of the year, they're primarily living underground in small mammal tunnels. They can't dig their own tunnels, 
they're not just not physically capable, but they share these small mammal tunnels that are dug by things like meadow voles and short-tailed shrews and mice, chipmunks. Um, and this was one of my study animals that we're looking at. And almost every day, I could go in the forest. I had a little flag stuck in the ground, a little ground flag, and I could pick up the leaf litter. And there he'd be at this entrance to this tunnel, just waiting for something to walk by that he could eat. So these guys are predators. You know, they're eating all kinds of small insects and other invertebrates, centipedes, millipedes, spiders, beetles, you know, worms. Um, and then on rainy nights, you know, they, they will come above ground and move and forage uh, above ground and, and move further away. So there's definitely an interesting relationship going on between small mammals and salamanders because they're using, you know, the same tunnels together. So I don't know if it's a, a you know, mutually beneficial or if the salamanders are just sort of taking advantage of this and the, and the mammals, mammals don't mind. So while these two species, Jefferson's and spotted salamanders, have very similar biologies, their conservation status is a little bit different. So spotted salamanders are relatively secure uh, in their range. They have a fairly large range all the way down to the Gulf states and you know, out, out to the Mississippi River and all across the Northeast. And um, you know, they use a wide variety of wetlands for breeding from vernal pools and beaver ponds species of greatest conservation need in Vermont, um, which is a, a designation in the, in the Vermont Wildlife Action Plan. And that's largely because of their dependence on vernal pools to maintain their current distribution. While the Jefferson salamander has this much smaller global range, it's really more limited to the, to the sort of the Ohio Valley in the northeastern US, and a very large percentage of its range is really focused there in the, in the Northeast. Um, and it's really, this is one species that is more limited to vernal pools and its breeding, especially around here. We find it really limited to primarily sort of up, upland, ridge top kind of vernal pools. And we don't find it as commonly down in the valleys. Um, it's considered a high priority species of greatest conservation need in both Vermont and New Hampshire. Um, and there's some evidence that there may be some population declines, particularly along the edges of its range, and that it may be more sensitive to habitat fragmentation than uh, the spotted salamander is. All right, so here are their distributions as we know it currently in Vermont, based from uh, the the Vermont Reptile and Amphibian Atlas Project. Jefferson salamander on the left, a spotted salamander on the right, which is pretty much found everywhere in the state. Jefferson salamander is, is a little more uh, limited in this area. It is found uh, around Orange County and northern Windsor County. And there are some pockets of throughout the, throughout the Champlain Valley and up into uh, parts of uh, Washington County as well. Um, it looks like no records for Randolph or Braintree, but there are records in, in Brookfield and Roxbury in, in this area. And then there's the blue spotted salamander. It's a little beauty. A little bit smaller than the Jefferson, to which it's most closely related. Um, and it has that beautiful blue flecking on the sides. And its distribution, <clears throat> again, its stronghold here in Vermont is the Champlain Valley. But there are these scattered populations. And as you see, there is, there is a, at least a few records from Randolph. Um, and, uh, and then down in the southern Connecticut Valley, down in the southwest corner, and then these scattered records from the Northeast Kingdom. So um, it's a fairly secretive species. It's a little harder to detect because its egg masses are very small and hard to see. That makes it hard to find, harder to find this, this particular species. But it has this kind of interesting global range where it's found in the Northeast, but then there's this big gap where it kind of wraps around the Great Lakes and up into Canada. So among these, these uh, three <coughs> salamanders, it's the, it's the one that ranges the furthest north. And then there's this really wild thing that goes on or that happened with Jefferson and blue spotted salamanders 
thousands of years ago where they hybridized and created these, these unique unisexual populations of salamanders that are, um, some of them are more closely related to blue spotted, so we call them the blue spotted complex. Some are more related, closely related, related to Jefferson salamanders, so we call them the Jefferson complex. And I could, I literally, I could do an hour long talk just about this alone. It's totally, it's so fascinating. These are unisexual populations of salamanders. They're all female. They need males because they need sperm to activate their eggs to develop, but there's no genetic material incorporated into the egg. So they lay eggs that are clones of themselves and they're all females. So you get, but they need males. So they're, 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 they're called, uh, uh, I forget the term now. Uh, but anyway, they're, they, they're basically using the males for sex, but they're not using any of their genetic material. Um, so you get where you have these hybrid populations, these unisexual populations with the, with the pure populations, um, they're skewed to the female. So you're going to find a population that's two to one, females to males. Whereas in a typical spotted salamander or pure Jefferson population, it's going to be skewed male, almost two to one male to female. Um, so in the long term, it's really a dead end because the males are not sharing their genetic material with these unisexual salamanders, only with the purers, but they don't know which it is that they're mating with. And the really wacky thing is they can have this weird genetic makeup in that they, you know, typical sexual breeding, you have a set of chromosomes from mom and a set of chromosomes from dad, right? Um, diploids. Well, these guys can have multiple sets of chromosomes. They can be pentaploids or tetraploids, up to five or six sets of chromosomes. So on the left, the top one is a pure blue spotted. The one in the middle is, has one set of chromosomes from blue spotted and one set of chromosomes from Jefferson's. The one on the bottom has two sets of chromosomes from blue spotted and one set of chromosomes from a Jefferson. It's, it's really wacky and it, it does, it makes identifying what you have a little bit more difficult because if they have a lot of Jefferson genes and a little bit of blue spotted, they might look a little bit like a blue spotted even though they're more of a Jefferson. So it makes uh, mapping their distribution really complicated as well. You must be a little bit there though because if they're not, if they're clones and they're not incorporating, uh, how are they getting these extra chromosomes? Yeah, I, that I don't know. Um, really? Yeah, there, well, there, there have, there, the latest research that I read um, uh, showed that they, they can incorporate some genetic material sometimes. Nobody knows what triggers that. At first they thought it was temperature because they, they were able to do it in the lab. So they thought maybe it's warmer water temperatures. So in the real world, it probably would never happen because these guys are breeding when the water temperature is like 34 degrees. Um, but in more recent studies uh, of another species that has the same, going on, same thing going on out in Ohio, they found that once in a while, they incorporated genetic materials. They don't know if it's some, some thing that's turned on by some environmental event or trigger. Um, so yeah, yet, yet to be determined. It's really a fascinating story that is still unfolding. And basically the last thing I'll say about this is the theory about how this all started was that during the last glacial event, it was one species of salamander that got isolated in two different refugia. And they, you know, they started to evolve a little bit. As the glacier retreated, they think these populations perhaps met in a few places. They were still closely enough related that they could interbreed, but they are on their way to becoming two different species. Um, and they created these hybrids because the hybrids are not being created now. So you can't take a pure Jefferson and made it with a pure blue spotted. It, that doesn't work. It's, they're not creating hybrids. These hybrids were created, you know, centuries ago as these unisexual populations. Yes, really wild. 
All right, back to the real world. Um, we'll talk about the wood frog a little bit. Um, the one frog that's really vernal pool dependent. Like the salamanders, it spends most of its life in the forests around vernal pools. Um, and uh, in the early spring, you know, it, it migrates to the pools to breed, just like the salamanders. Its distribution is statewide, probably our most abundant frog, perhaps one of our most abundant frogs. <clears throat> it's the frog that ranges the furthest north in North America, above the Arctic Circle, all the way up to uh, Hudson Bay and up to the Arctic Ocean. Pretty remarkable distribution for a frog. And one of the things that allows it to do that is a unique strategy um, to survive, to overwinter. And we're gonna watch a little video here. Let me just turn the... That's right, it's loud enough. <laughs> He said, he said we don't know why they, they come back to life, so to speak. I think we do. It's for sex. I mean, <laughs> that's why. So after uh, spending the winter frozen, just under the leaf litter, they make a little like hibernaculum, like two inches below the leaf litter. Um, they thaw out, and they make an immediate 
migration on a rainy, cold, rainy night to a vernal pool that's you know, like 34 degrees, and the first thing they do is start um, you know, breeding, or at least attempting to breed. The males arrive first. This is a male. Most of you have probably heard what a wood frog sounds like. A little bit like a duck. Uh, so the males have these paired vocal sacs on either side of their, their head. Uh, the males float around on the pools calling incessantly. They haven't eaten since being frozen solid all winter. And, uh, and they're just waiting for the females to arrive. They'll attach themselves to anything that they think might be a female, which might be other frogs, might be it might be a spotted salamander. Uh, it might be a herpetologist boot. Who knows? <laughs> um, they're extremely amorous and, and ready for ready for getting on with it. So they probably so they can get out and eat something. Uh, so uh, let's see. There we go. I'm sorry to bother you. Might have to talk to somebody to witness the incident. I'll stay. So unlike the. Um, <clears throat> salamanders who have who have this in, internal fertilization frogs have external fertilization so the once the male uh, does grab a female it gets into what's known as amplexus with the male on top of the female the females are typically larger because they're carrying the eggs um, so they need to be they need to be larger uh, and they're often this reddish color in the spring really beautiful the males tend to be darker brown in the, in the spring. During the summer, when you see them, they're usually very tan. Um, so they get in the amplexus. As the female begins to deposit the eggs, she vibrates a little bit. And that's a signal to the male to release the sperm into the water. And as the eggs are being laid, they're fertilized at the, at the moment of, of being laid. So no internal fertilization. Uh, eggs are usually, usually laid in these large communal masses very often. Um, so each female only lays one egg mass. Um, and it's again about the size of a golf ball when she lays it. And it quickly swells up to baseball size. Um, but you, again, you often have these communal masses, which probably helps to increase uh, solar absorption, big dark mat floating in the water. Um, also can reduce predation because there's safety in numbers. Those at the middle are going to be much more protected uh, and may also protect a lot of the eggs from temperature extremes because, again, those in the middle are going to be more protected if during cold snaps. <clears throat> All right, let's just look at the four eggs of these four species that we just talked about, the four amphibians. So in the We'll start in the bottom left, spotted salamander, which is very, uh, very common, widely, dis widely distributed. Uh, all salamander eggs have, um, have a, a jelly around the embryo, and then they have a whole, the whole mass of embryos is encased in another mass of jelly, a matrix of jelly. And you can clearly see that outer jelly matrix on the spotted salamander egg mass. That's the key to, to knowing whether it's a salamander or an egg, I mean, or a frog. So let's contrast that with the wood frog eggs on the right on the bottom. They appear kind of lumpy. There's no outer jelly matrix holding it all together. So those, each of those little individual embryos could, could sort of slough off and become smaller little clumps of eggs. And they're fairly fragile in that respect when you pick them up. The, the egg mass can break into s several pieces, whereas a spotted salamander egg mass is really pretty firm and well protected. <clears throat> so then we'll go to the other salamanders. In the upper left is the Jefferson. It does have an outer jelly matrix, but again, it's hard to see because it's, it's very thin. Um, the, the embryos themselves are smaller. There's a fewer number of embryos, and they're, they tend to be very cylindrical in shape very often. And then the blue spotted are really hard to see. They're often laid singly, just laid on the bottom of the leaf litter, a single egg or maybe two or three together, um, like this small little clump. So they're, they're very hard to find. 
Um, uh, and then the, the unisexual egg masses often have a lot of inviable or dead embryos that are just white, pure white. So they have a high proportion. I don't have, I didn't put in a slide of that. Um, but it could some, sometimes it's 60, 70% of the embryos are, are not viable. And I'm not sure why that is, if that's because they didn't, um, maybe they were, they didn't get um, activated by the sperm they picked up, or maybe there's something else going on with the unisexuals that we don't know. This is really fascinating though. Spotted salamanders, for, well, for more than 100 years, we've known that there's this algae that grows in spotted salamander eggs. Some of the early naturalists noted this and named it Oophilia amblystomatis. It's a unique algae that only is found in spotted salamander egg masses. But more recently, they discovered that it's not just in the salamander eggs, it's in the salamander embryos. It's in, and it's actually in some adult salamanders, in their cells. Algae growing in a vertebrate cell. It's the only known case of algae growing inside of a vertebrate cell. Um, so now they're wondering if do the adults actually pass it on to the, to the egg masses. At first they thought, well, the algae finds the egg mass and starts growing in the egg mass. But now it's thinking maybe it's the other way around. Maybe the adults are passing that algae on to the egg mass. What's the benefit? Well, the photosynthesis of the algae produces more oxygen for the embryos. So in these low oxygen breeding sites where they're often breeding, where there's very low oxygen, shallow water, fairly warm at times, um, they're providing more oxygen for the embryos to develop. And their byproducts, the urine from the embryos, is, is uh, being used by the algae. And then how is the algae surviving inside the adults? Yeah, we don't know that. I don't know that. I don't know if anybody knows that yet. <clears throat> so the larva, the, uh, the eggs, the eggs, uh, depending on species, spotted salamander eggs might hatch in anywhere from, uh, let's see, probably just getting three weeks to maybe a month or so, the, the eggs will hatch. Wood frog eggs hatch fairly quickly, might be just 10 days to two weeks, um, depending on water temperature there because of a big variation. Um, the, the warmer it is, the more speedy their development. The, la the salamander larvae have these feathery gills on the top there. Um, wood frog tadpoles look like tadpoles with a big head, internal gills, and the, and the big tail. Um, salamanders are predators. Their larvae are predators. So as when they first hatch, they're feeding on primarily zooplankton. Um, and as they grow, they'll feed on larger things like copepods or uh, sometimes even uh, small insects or other invertebrates. Um, wood frog tadpoles are omnivores. They're mostly feeding, again, on that paraphyton, that fuzz, high, high nutrient-rich fuzz. Uh, and both of these have fairly high mortality rates. So on average, it's 80 to 90 percent. That's an average, which includes years where the pool dries and there's 100 percent mortality. You know, in a good year, you know, the 30 or 40 percent um, mortality might be normal in a good year when there's a lot of water. Um, but on average, high mortality. So the adults are, um, you know, taking their chances with a lot of offspring, no parental care. They're not investing any time in caring or protecting their young, just laying the eggs, getting out of there, and hoping for the best. Um, the juvenile stage, <clears throat> so late summer, um, you know, two to three months after the eggs are laid, the young are leaving the pools. So for wood frogs, it might be as early as mid or late July. Salamanders, it's usually in early August. Um, but there's some flexibility there, so they'll stay in the pool longer um, because they'll get bigger. Uh, their survivorship is better the longer they stay in the pool. <clears throat> so once they leave, um, this is their sort of dispersal period. Um, the upper left photo is a, is a young spotted salamander about two months old. So this was in 
September or October. Um, I found this guy. The one in my hand on the, on the far right is probably a two-year-old or so. This is the period where they're wandering the forest, wandering the landscape. They could go for, they could go for miles before they become an adult. They're, salamanders are long-lived, surprisingly long-lived, 20, 25 years, maybe 30 years. Um, wood frogs don't live so long. But the salamanders take uh, four to five years to reach adult breeding age. So during that period is when they're dispersing, colonizing, you know, new areas, um, and, uh, you know, sharing genetic material. They, they all don't return to the same pool where they were born. That would just, you know, that wouldn't be genetically viable for very long. Some do, but they all don't. There has to be genetic exchange between pools. Wood frogs probably only live two to three years, maybe four. You know, if a female breeds twice in her lifetime, that's probably pretty good for a, for a wood frog. Um, they're about an inch long when they, when they leave the pools, sometimes half an inch long. Um, they're usually mature, sexually mature, in, a, in the following spring. Um, it might take two years if they had to leave the pool early and they were really small. <coughs> Um, frogs are much better dispersers than salamanders because, well, they can hop. They can just, they're just better at getting across the ground. <clears throat> All right, so we, we mentioned that we know that these animals spend most of their lives in the forests around pools. So we know that those habitats are important for their longevity. So we know, you know, if you're going to think about conserving these species, of course, we need to conserve their breeding pools, the blue dots on this, on this graphic. Those are the pools. But then we also need to think about how much habitat around those pools um, we need to think about if you're you know, doing forestry or um, trying to develop a conservation strategy or conservation plan for a piece of land. So generally, as, as we talked about earlier, 175 meters is, or 200 yards or so is kind of a life zone for these amphibians. That's the area that the adults need around the pools uh, to survive. But you also need to think about maintaining some sort of connections between those pools, <clears throat> depending on how, you know, how far apart they are and what's between them. So in this case, you know, this pool that's further to the left you want to try to maintain some forested habitat between the other pools so that there can be genetic exchange between those pools. We also know that roads are pretty bad for, for amphibians if they have to cross roads between their overwintering sites and their breeding sites. So there's been a lot of work uh, being done on that as well. <clears throat> Uh, so let's just finish up by talking a little bit about some of the projects that um, I've got going on for, uh, for vernal pool conservation. So the first is mapping vernal pools. And I know some towns have been actively mapping vernal pools. Tom and Braintree have been doing some mapping of their vernal pools. That's a project I started, um, I don't know, seven or eight years ago, and it's ongoing. Most recently, we just started the Vernal Pool Monitoring Project. Last year, this is our kind of first full year of data collection for the monitoring project. Um, and then the next thing I'm, I'm looking to do is to really start promoting the use of best management practices around vernal pools. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about the mapping and the monitoring projects just very briefly. Um, the mapping project was started for the simple reason that if you don't know where something is, you can't conserve it. And we didn't know where the vernal pools were in the state of Vermont because vernal pools typically don't appear on the national wetland inventory maps, the NWI maps, or on the Vermont state wetland inventory maps. So these are the, all the inventoried wetlands in Woodstock. Then we, we did a project just in Woodstock and mapped the, pool, the vernal pools and almost no overlap between them. So we know that they don't appear on the wetland map. So we wanted to know where they are in the state, how many we had, where they were. So we did some, some color aerial, uh, aerial photo interpretation to locate vernal pools. 
And the other thing we knew through this process is that we were losing vernal pools. So right in the middle of this color infrared aerial photograph right there is a classic vernal pool. In these, these color infrared photos, uh, anything red is actively photosynthesizing. These photos are taken typically in early May or before the leaf out occurs. So you can see water. Water shows up as a really clean black. And that's a very classic vernal pool. There's no streams going in and out of it like a permanent pond would have. It's a vernal pool. This was a 1991 photo. 10 years later, there's a house and a barn built right where that vernal pool was. So we know, we knew that we were learning, losing vernal pools. And so the wetland office also made a change to the regulations about how vernal pools are protected. Now vernal pools are considered class two wetlands if they have evidence of amphibians using them for breeding. So they're, they're regulated on a, on a state level. That was, uh, that occurred about the same time, seven or eight years ago, the new wetland rules. Um, <clears throat> and so here's the map, kind of our rough map that we came up with, mapping all, the, all these potential pools across Vermont, almost 5,000 potential pools using just these aerial photo uh, interpretation. And then for a couple years, we did a big effort to go out and field verify as many of those as we could on mostly on public lands where we didn't, we didn't have to get landowner permission, um, although we did get some sites where we had landowner permission. So to date, we've field verified almost a thousand vernal pools in the state. But we have a long way to go to, to verify all of them. And of course, our mapping didn't pick up all of them. And our mapping also picked up a lot of uh, false positives. So what we thought were pools sometimes turned out to be seeps instead of vernal pools, or sometimes turn out to be something else, like uh, one was a big tire dump. It was just a big <laughs> pile of tires in the woods. Um, or sometimes it's just a shadow from a big conifer in the woods that looked like water on the aerial photo. So what we're, what we're still hoping people will do will get out and help us to field verify Fernal pools. You can either do it on your own property or, or on uh, you know neighbor's property. You do need landowner permission because these data, if you submit it to the vernal pool mapping project to the atlas, it eventually goes to the state as a as a, a wetland layer. So they do need landowner permission for that if you're collecting the data on the ground. Um, all right, where are we? Okay, and so we'll just finish up with the monitoring project. Um, this is an effort to really collect long-term data on a suite of vernal pools all over the state. I think we're up to almost 50 vernal pools in the state that we're monitoring. Um, this is a citizen science project, so it's teams of two volunteers sort of adopt a vernal pool. You go out to that vernal pool uh, four times during the year. Well, the first time is just to set out the equipment. There's that water temperature logger that automatically logs the water temperature to, to tell us how, how long the pool holds water. There's a little digital recorder that we set out that's programmed to record um, for about, uh, records for about a half hour during, uh, during the night, during the evenings, from the time you set it out till the batteries run out. And that's mostly just to pick up the wood frog, the onset of the wood frog calling, so we know exactly the when wood frogs start breeding. That's a good indicator of when the salamanders start breeding as well. And it's mostly to look at the phenology, the, the timing of that breeding. Is it, does it stay the same going 10, 20 years down the road, or is it getting earlier with climate change? Um, then we also do egg mass counts. And we do another visit about this time of year where you walk the perimeter of the pool and you count wood frog and salamander egg masses to give us an idea of the size of those populations and the breeding effort. Uh, and then you do another egg mass count a few weeks later. Uh, and you also, we're also inventorying or counting, doing some quick counts of two invertebrates, caddisfly larvae, which are really common, very abundant, easy to see. And you basically just do a quick count in a meter square plot at four points in the pool. 
And then if they're a, if they're a fairy shrimp, you do the same thing for fairy shrimp. <clears throat> Uh, yeah. So, um, in a vernal pool like that, are the egg masses confined to the pool? They're not, but we're just counting to make it something that everyone can do because vernal pools are different sizes and different shapes, dip different depths. To try to standardize it for everyone, we're just counting within a meter of the shore. So you walk around and count any any eggs within a meter, and if you can see eggs deeper you can do an estimated count further out in deeper water. But sometimes, you know, some pools are very tannin, the water is very tannin stained and you can't see very far into the pools. Some pools are big and three feet deep and you can't count the egg masses. And we also really didn't want people wading into the water to try to count every single egg mass. First of all, it can be dangerous. The, the water's cold, it's in the 30s. Um, it, some, some of these pools are deep. But also, there are some uh, diseases that can be spread from pool to pool they, that you can get on your boots and transfer from pool to pool. So we just felt it easier not to have people actually going into the water to count eggs. So those are the reasons we've just doing a sample of the egg masses. Um, and I think those are the basic, the basic things we're monitoring other than sort of standardized things like depth, how the water level changes, uh, weather, size, things like that. Um, so that's it. <laughs> be happy to try to entertain any questions. I'm going to turn it and get the lights. Thanks. Yeah. Will the spotted salamander navigate across a stream or a brook? They can, yeah. One of my radial tagged salamanders went across it pretty good stream um, that surprised me but yeah they'll go it depends on you know they would they wouldn't cross the first branch of the white river probably but a stream sure and how big can they get i've only seen one a mm -hmm. few years ago they can they can get large they grow throughout their life they never stop growing and because they're long-lived you know i've seen them 10 inches long more typical is six six inches. The females are bigger than the males. You know, again, they have to carry the eggs, so they're bigger. And so there are owls that are preying on them. What other? Uh, some mammals, so minks, mink will prey on them, uh, raccoons, uh, and hawks, broad-winged hawks and red-shouldered hawks in particular. Again, I don't think it's a coincidence that broad-winged hawks are arriving like right now. I'm, I'm certain that they're following the migrating wood frogs from Connecticut up through New England. Because they, they arrived, first broadwing I saw was last Friday. Um, they might choose one pool over another in one year just because they tended to overwinter nearby probably. But the, the one thing that comp complicates all this information about these species is amphibians are really hard to study long term because our typical ways of marking animals doesn't work with amphibians. So we can't, it's really hard to um, track them over many years. You know, with birds, we can put a band on their leg and they carry that band for their life. Um, with salamanders, we can't do that because they shed their skin. And same with frogs, they shed their skin multiple times during the summer and having something attached to them gets in the way. Um, we can't, uh, so you can't attach things to them. They breathe through their skin. Um, so there have been some more high-tech sort of ways where you can sort of insert uh, almost like um, one of these, you know, the grocery scanner tags, you know, that you scan your groceries. Pit tags, they're called pit tags. They basically have a code and you catch the animal and you rub your wand over it or swipe your wand and see if it's one of your animals. But it's fairly expensive. It's not as inexpensive as, as bird banding. Um, so again, it's hard to have some of these long-term studies that look at what individual animals do. I think I just have a vague recollection from like, more than 40 years ago of like Dr. Shoot from URI clipping to toes. Yes. And, um, but of course, you're limited to... Um, well, yeah, well, that was the body. standard thing was clipping um, toes. But amphibians grow, regrow their toes. So okay. that doesn't work. <laughs> Uh, amphibians 
are amazing. They can regrow a limb. They, if, you, if they lose a limb, they can regrow an entire limb. Um, some salamanders have been known to regrow eyes if they get an eye damaged, regrow their tails. In fact, some salamanders, you know, have a, the four-toed salamander has a, has a me a, an anti-predator mechanism that it drops its tail, and its tail will sit there wiggling while the salamander sort of slithers away, and this predator grabs the tail, and then they grow a new tail. So yeah, clipping the toes, that works for a, uh, for one season. Oh, because it, because what I remember him talking about was that he had determined that not only did they did the breeding adults return to the same pond, but that he had buried cans so that when they, they actually would fall in the exact same pond from year to year. So how could he? How I wonder. Well, unless he's yeah, unless he's able to, um, you know, the next year reclip it or mm -hmm. see that it hasn't regrown fully. Mm -hmm. I don't know how quickly they'll regrow, okay, so but yeah. they will regrow there. Okay, because yeah. I, I, yeah, I never read the study myself, yeah. but I just remember you talking about it. Yeah, and it, it's, it is remarkable. They they will and often enter the pool and exit the pool in the same spot. Yeah. Jeez. Many of my study animals, uh, you know, entered the pool. I caught it uh, entering the pool or exiting the pool the same place it entered. The other the way that people are identifying spotted salamanders now is just taking a photograph of their spot pattern and then using software to analyze that spot pattern and give it a unique code and then they can and then the next year they photograph all their salamanders and run through the software and it'll tell you if you have matches so that works great uh, with digital photography that's really easy to do uh, we have our uh, wooded hillside behind our house there's a brown pool that the utility <laughs> company has on their maps as well but um, we have always, we've lived there 20 years and lots of wood frogs, and beavers, and clearly wood frogs, and the duck noise. And, and the last two years, last year and this year, there's no wood frogs. Mm -hmm. And um, what would cause that? Do they, some event or? Yeah, I mean, it could have been a, it could have been a, a die off event, from, more likely from a, from one of the diseases, there's two particular diseases that can affect wood frog. The rhinovirus is the one that's known to be in Vermont. I don't think we've no, uh, I don't think anybody's found any huge die-offs. It mostly affects the tadpoles, so I wouldn't expect a complete, um, you know, population loss in you know, one season of the adults. Um, it's usually it affects, so you know, rhinovirus affects the tadpoles, the tadpoles don't survive to metamorphose. Uh, and then the other one is a fungus, called chytrid fungus. Um, that does affect the adults. Don't think we know of any uh, examples of chytrid in Vermont. Pretty sure it hasn't been found in the Northeast, but chytrid is the, is the, the, the culprit for losing a lot of our tropical frogs. And, you know, 20 years ago, there was a big thing about the, uh, the frogs in Costa Rica disappearing. That was when chytrid was discovered. Um, so you know, other than that, I, mean, I can't think of a you know, kind of a predatory event that would cause, to wipe out an entire breeding population. It was a virus. I mean, it was like... Yeah, I mean, I could see a decline in lower number, even, you know, or even... Are they ever later than the beavers? Because, like, um, we have both, and they usually were around the same time. Maybe they haven't, they'd be started by now. Should have, should have started by now. We still see the, the young frogs in the summer, in, like, in the yeah, garden and, and around in the yeah. But I don't see as many yeah, in the leaf litter as I used to. I used to see hundreds of them in the leaf litter. I don't see as many. Do turkeys predate? Mm -hmm. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Turkeys. Well, our whole 14 acres is scratched up every fall. Yeah, they'll definitely, especially the, the meadows, but they'll eat the adults too. Yeah. But I, I, I can't see a predator wiping out every last no. one. Oh, right. um, you know, the other thing to keep in mind with uh, these frogs that use that uh, super cooling or the freezing overwintering strategy. There's two other peepers do it as well. And gray tree frogs use the same exact strategy for overwintering. That only protects them down to about 20 degrees. So they still need snow cover. So 
for insulation. So if we get, you know, with climate change, if we get winters where we don't have snow cover or we don't have deep snow cover and we get a really cold couple of nights, we can have a large mortality of those frogs because they're not protected. You know, they're, they're only under the leaf litter, and then they might be two inches in the soil, not a lot of insulation there. So they might be able to withstand a night down to 10 degrees without snow cover, but much below that. They tend to gonna... migrate in, like, I mean, over time, you find that spot again? Yeah, I think so. I think think so. so if there's some, yeah, there some stochastic event that would wiped out that whole population, I would think it would be recolonized fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. Frogs are pretty good at that. Well, thanks a lot, everybody. Thank Enjoy you. the discussion.